Terrific. I'd like to talk to you today about residency programs. The residency program is an important part of the education of a physician in the United States healthcare system. But basically, this is a long apprentices program where this, the residents work as physicians under the supervision and under the license of their supervisors who are known as attending physicians. The reason we're here today is that although sometimes these things go rather well, um, there are often some pretty significant challenges. Uh, tragically, sometimes very talented people uh, do not succeed in these programs. And we wanna try to get a little insight about why using a systems thinking lens. Uh, just a little bit of background data about why this problem is important to us. Attrition of surgical resident programs ranges uh, in the neighborhood of 18 uh, percent, and it's much higher for females than it is for males. The Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, which is the governing body that supervises residency programs in the United States, has work hour limits that they've recently introduced, and even those have not affected patterns or rates of attrition in the programs. Almost a third of general surgery residents, for example, require some kind of remediation. And when we ask students and residents about why these problems are occurring, the most commonly cited answers are the attitudes of their senior residents and faculty and other uh, characteristics of the of the programs themselves. So let's hear from a program director. So a resident that comes to mind is um, in her first year of residency, um, and there was a one day she was on call with a chief resident, but she was kind of afraid of him, and he was um, a little tough. She was afraid to call him. There was um, a patient outcome on the floor that was suboptimal, um, and the nurses on the floor never forgot that. And that became um, an issue for them, that they didn't trust her. And over time, the nurses were pretty brutal to her in ways that they weren't with her other colleagues. They would call the chiefs or go over her head and go directly to attendings, um, which actually annoyed then the people who were working with her as part of the medical team, because they knew that when they were on with her, um, that they'd be called more by the nurses because the nurses didn't trust her and would just go around her. Eventually, um, this resident became avoidant and she sort of gave up. She just said, um, I'm just going to do what I need to do to graduate. The worst part was that um, because of this performance over time, um, she couldn't get the glowing letters that she would need to apply for the competitive fellowship that she started medical school to um, pursue. So ultimately, she practices, but she did not um, become what she had planned to become. So what I'd like to do is, uh, as a roadmap for this presentation, show you a causal loop diagram that captures some of the core thinking that we derived by interviewing some people involved in residency programs, both residents, nurses associated with those residency programs, and some program directors themselves, uh, and then turn that into a simulating system dynamics model that we can use to try to draw some insights about the kinds of behaviors that the feedback structure of a residency might generate. So the first core idea is an idea I'm gonna call competence. Competence is actually formally identified by the ACGME uh, as a set of six different competences that a, uh, a resident doctor is required to have before they graduate from their residency programs, such as patient care, medical knowledge, interpersonal skills, and even system-based practice. Competence is something that builds up over time. It's the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, the capabilities that generate the performance that we're hoping for uh, from our physicians. And of course, we can compare performance during a residency program to some sort of set of expectations or desired performance as the resident progresses through the program. And if there's a performance shortfall, the typical prescription for what to do about that is to ask the resident to put in more effort to learn, to do more studying, to read the books a little harder, to go to the sim lab, to ask for help, and so on. And that effort to learn presumably will build some competence. This closes what you all recognize as a balancing feedback loop. And I'm going to call it the diligent resident loop uh, so that we can refer to it a little bit later. Please note before I move on, that this diagram 
might be a pretty good representation of the what I would consider to be somewhat impoverished mental model of quite a number of faculty and attending physicians in many residence, uh, residency programs, where it's basically saying it's all about the resident. A good resident, hardworking, will succeed. A resident that doesn't put in the right efforts isn't going to make it. Um, what we're going to do later in the talk is add another feedback loop to this in the form of a reinforcing loop. I'll talk about the learning environment. But before we do that, I want to zoom in a little more closely into the behavior of the balancing loop structure that I've shown you there. We started this effort by actually asking some residency program directors to describe what the expectations of a typical resident would be over the course of their, in this example, four-year residency program. And what they basically all said was that progress is pretty rapid at first, and that rate of growth slows down over time. You will all recognize this as a pattern that is quite consistent with what we see with a traditional learning curve. We start with a stock that we're calling competence, and that fills up by learning that comes from doing cases and uh, uh, being, um, being uh, gaining experience under the supervision of their uh, attendings. As competence increases over its initial competence, that creates a multiplying, a multiplying effect governed by the strength of learning that multiplies the initial performance to improve performance over time. This structure generates exactly that pattern of behavior, uh, completely consistent with what our, um, the, our program directors suggested uh, was the typical expectation. And the important move we made in our modeling here was that we set the desired performance in the model exactly equal to the performance generated by this structure. So in this simple open loop model, what happens if you have the strength of learning set to its native value, performance will exactly equal desired performance and there will be no performance shortfall. What we're gonna do with our model is close that feedback loop. The performance shortfall is a stimulus to put in more efforts to improve performance, closing the feedback loop that uh, gives the resident more uh, opportunities and more uh, case completion learning. That is the balancing feedback loop I previously called the diligent resident loop. The model requires the resident to be pretty capable in order to be successful. This is not a story about a bad resident can actually succeed. The interesting thing, however, of course, is when we have a good resident, by which I mean someone who has the talent and skills, or at least the talent and uh, intellect, such that the strength of learning is consistent with what the performance expectations are based on what will happen in those situations. And so I'd love to hear a little bit from another program director. The, the beginning of the story is that um, he and I were involved in a situation where a patient were, had, a, had a bad outcome from a complication. It was a procedural complication. After the complication, Ronnie was pretty upset, as was I, nobody wants that. Um, during the procedure itself, he lost his temper with uh, one of the nurses and actually was yelling at her. And he, he took the time almost the next, I think it was the next day, to go back to that person and apologize to them. He talked about how um, he had invested in the process of care and how sometimes these things happen even despite our best intention. So effectively, he sort of accepted the outcome that we don't always have all control of the outcomes. Uh, he spent extra time researching and understanding what kinds of moves you could make despite the complication. Seemed like over the ensuing weeks, he really seemed to be back to his normal self. He seemed like he actually had recovered from that event. And I was really impressed with that. Unfortunately, what can happen to even a good resident, a strong resident with the right kind of skills is something unusual that uh, 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 we're gonna call a setback. So what I'm gonna show you here is a simulation where we have the desired performance in the red line there and performance is continuing along the proper trajectory, but then in week 10, there's this setback, which appears there as that little uh, cliff, the 
that uh, shows there. And what you see is the resident continues to, uh, to grow and improve performance, but there's a chronic performance shortfall. It starts out pretty large, and then there's some catching up. Um, please note that in this uh, simulation right now, we have not actually closed the balancing feedback loops. The idea that performance sort of levels off over time actually creates some forgivingness in the environment of residency programs. And that's a good thing. That's what, one of the reasons that even with setbacks, people can catch up later on uh, during the programs. That's the basic behavior. Now let's add in the idea that this resident wants to do something about it and works a little bit harder. That's what the green line shows here. And there is actually a green line in the performance graph, although it's a little difficult to see. You can see performance has improved improved a bit. Uh, the performance shortfall has reduced, although it's not completely gone away. And that's happening because in the lower graph, you see there's more learning that's coming from the, uh, the, the additional work that the resident is doing. Indeed, if he puts in even more effort, there's a gray line that shows up. And you can see that with that gray line, really hard, diligent, excessive work, uh, the resident can actually close the gap and uh, bring performance back to par by the end of um, the timeline of this simulation. Interesting situation. This uh, set of simulations demonstrates that hard work can pay off. It also uh, demonstrates that the model itself is simulating a situation where a resident can be successful despite a setback. What I'd like to do now is think about what happens to a resident who has this random setback but is embedded in a somewhat unforgiving environment. Let's listen to a conversation. You look great, but how was your call? Uh, you know what, it was kind of brutal, to be honest. You know who I was on with. I mean, I don't even know if you know the story. She started with that outcome as an intern. I don't know. I think she just got so avoidant of the OR after that. Really, that could have happened to anyone. But boy, she is withdrawn. She doesn't oh. capitalize on opportunities. So you just dread being on with her because you just know you're going to work so much harder because you're basically going to do her job too because nobody trusts her. You know, I have to work with her tomorrow. I'm on. I'm wondering if I should just tell the attending to close instead of. Well, to. that's, I mean, that's what you just need to do. And you have to tell your resident too. Like just if something happens, don't trust whatever she says. Mm -hmm. We're busy mm -hmm. enough. We don't have time for that. Disengage. Like, no, you know, no, Not at all. it's just a whole lot easier to do it myself. So, yeah. you know, that's what it is. But anyway, we should get going because uh, I, I just got paged. So I'm going to need to go and oh. What we're hearing in this conversation is that the lower performance or the lot higher performance shortfall is starting to compromise trust, reputation, uh, interactions with nurses, uh, the tutelage and mentoring that uh, the resident is getting from their superiors. And so that reduces the opportunities that a person has and, and uh, unfortunately would interfere with the opportunity to build comp competence. So this closes a reinforcing feedback loop that uh, we're gonna call the learning environment loop. And I'm gonna operationalize that by uh, introducing a stock of trust into our model. So we're gonna add the stock of trust. Trust is gonna be basically a first order information de delay or smooth of the performance or performance shortfall of the, uh, of the resident. And the important idea about trust is that trust has an effect on opportunities. If your supervisor, your attending physician uh, thinks you're great, they give you lots of opportunities, you scrub in a lot on cases and, and it actually increases your case completion learning, and conversely, if they're a little nervous about you, they don't trust you very much, you don't get so many opportunities, you don't get so much coaching and mentoring, and case completion learning actually uh, can be compromised. So this closes a reinforcing loop that can be either a virtuous or a vicious cycle, and uh, we want to try to model and understand exactly how that's going to work. So let's look at a few simulations of this. So what I'm going to show you here is a simulation that is the same simulation as we did before with the resident who uh, suffers a setback. You can see the performance shortfall somewhat recovering over time. Now I've added in the variable for trust. This is here so you can compare it to what happens when we activate the reinforcing loop for trust. In this case, 
that you see here, the blue line, the reinforcing loop is not closed. But when we add in the reinforcing loop, uh, you can see the performance deteriorates still further. The performance shortfall stays high chronically, and you can see the trust is, uh, is lower. Uh, it stays low, uh, and you can see by the end of the simulation that uh, the, the trust has not recovered to its, uh, its appropriate normal values in the beginning. What I want to do next is show the behavior if the effect of trust is more uh, severe than what I show you in this simulation here. And I've run five simulations here, starting if we look at the performance shortfall graph in the upper right, starting in the bottom, the blue line is no, tr no trust effect. The green line is the one I just showed you. And then the gray, black, and brown lines are increasingly harsher environments uh, with stronger effects of trust. What I want you to notice about this is it gets worse with a stronger uh, uh, kind of higher loop gain, if you will, around the re reinforcing loop for trust. And most importantly, that in the brown line, we can see that the system has crossed a tipping point. You can see the brown line is a situation where the system has gone past that tipping point. Uh, and you can see in the trust graph at the bottom, that trust is deteriorating sort of catastrophically out of control here. So this is a very unfortunate situation. But there's one thing missing from this, which is this is still a set of simulations where the hardworking resident has not put in the extra effort. So one more set of simulations here uh, past the tipping point, but now we're going to look uh, at what happens when we show you the behavior of the full model. Now the balancing loop is active. Our strong resident is working as hard as they can to try to offset the challenges of the setback and the perhaps um, harsh uh, learning environment that they're working in. And what you see in the upper left graph is the same graph that I showed you on the previous page, just for comparison. Compare that to the upper uh, right graph, which now is the one where the resident is working rather hard. You can see the lines are lower. The shortfalls are, are decreased relative to what they would otherwise have been. And I've also added in a red line, which is even harsher still. And so what you can see from these graphs is that the efforts of the resident uh, make things better. They change the the magnitude of the problem here, but they do not eliminate the, tip, the tipping point. They only push it out a little bit further. And so the system is, is, uh, is one that still has a high risk tipping point that might cause things to really go south quickly. So I'd like to wrap this up with a few concluding points about what this simple model has actually been able to tell us. Uh, one thing is that uh, the sort of basic idea that it all started with, interactions of the learning environment actually greatly impact a physician's progress through training, uh, which is something, of course, we knew before we started the modeling effort. What we've really identified here is that reinforcing loops can act as vicious cycles that unfortunately can exacerbate the consequences of an, even a random setback among an otherwise uh, intendedly successful uh, resident. Even their extra efforts may not be enough to counteract some of these dysfunctional interactions with the environment because the system has a tipping point beyond which performance can deteriorate catastrophically. So what does this mean for our residency programs? Well, think about this, most of the time, the approach to improving a resident's progress is trying to push the balancing loops harder. Go out there and work harder, study harder, do more stuff, push, 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 and strengthen the balancing loop. And what I hope this work has called attention to is that the reinforcing loops themselves are actually quite important. If we do not do anything to interfere or mitigate the challenges these reinforcing loops can generate, the system can overwhelm even a talented resident. And so what we really need to do is find ways to help and coach our residency program directors and our attendings to address some of the challenges that this reinforcing loop is trying to capture, not just pushing the balancing loop. And that would mean doing things like attending to um, the culture, the ability to mentor, the opportunities, the equity within the uh, and across the residents and so on to make sure that um, these possibly vicious cycles can actually become virtuous cycles and help more and more of these talented young professionals succeed in their chosen career. 
Thank you. And we're going to turn it over now to question and answer. For uh, q and A, I actually like to uh, give the word to Brad and uh, his co-authors. Hi, hi, Paolo. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, hello to everybody in Frankfurt. Uh, delighted to be with you all virtually. And I wanted to just take a moment and introduce my two co-authors. Um, uh, Brad, we are trying to get your uh, uh, oh, your presentation, or at least your faces on the screen, the main screen. And uh, we also need to uh, um, um, increase the volume, please. All right, uh, we're good to go, Brad. Please go ahead. All right, I'll try that again. Uh, great to be with you all, and I want to introduce my co-authors. Uh, first of all, we have with us um, Laurie Berkowitz. Dr. Laurie Berkowitz is the uh, former program director for the Obstetrics and Gynecology Residency Program. Uh, it's an integrated program at uh, two really uh, uh, powerful hospitals in the Boston area, uh, Mass General Hospital and uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. And uh, she has uh, moved on from that role to now uh, taking on the role of Associate Director for Graduate Medical Education, which includes a lot of responsibilities, notably that she's also uh, very involved in the faculty development of other program directors uh, throughout the the, that hospital system. So uh, really delighted to have Lori with us. Uh, we also have Dr. Rebecca Meinhardt. Uh, uh, Rebecca is the division chief of uh, obstetrics anesthesia, and uh, she's also the uh, director of the uh, obstetric anesthesia fellowship program. And so these are wonderful credentials that they both have, but I also know them both personally for a few years, and I want to thank them so much for uh, giving me a glimpse of the challenges that this talk is about. Uh, it's really been an absolute joy to work with them, and I'm really delighted they could join me for here for this presentation from wherever they are in the world, which is in two, we're in three different places, obviously, but yeah. So uh, uh, that's it for now. Over to you, Paolo. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the team of uh, researchers. We have a number of questions coming up, and I think we're going to start with the basic ones here. So what are residency programs and their directors doing to try to address these issues? So, uh, Paolo, I think what I'm going to do is when I hear a question, I might just sort of suggest who would be a good person to talk about that. So maybe uh, Rebecca can take that one. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, it's my pleasure. It's a great honor to be here today and talk about this. Um, so sadly, I think a lot of programs are not doing much about this. And um, going to a decade's worth of program director uh, national meetings where they actually have multiple um, workshops and, and plenaries and all kinds of things about how do you recruit so that you don't have this problem with residents and how do you manage a struggling resident when you do have one, none of them really address, have, have ever addressed the environment. So I think we have a lot of work to do on a national scale to start to institute a better, more evidence-based look at our, our clinical learning environments. The accrediting body, ACGME, is doing some to, to look at this through the, uh, a, new, a new way they're looking at programs. Maybe Lori can fill in uh, for, for any of the things that um, she thinks are useful here, but, but uh, suffice it to say, we have a long road to go on this. Yeah, I would say that there are pockets of progress in this um, in this area, and so by no means is anything pervasive. But I would say what I have seen over time within um, at a department level in the clinical departments within our hospital, there's some emphasis on um, team training, and that is bringing different role groups together to sort of get at some of those. Um, um, pieces of the learning environment, but this is not pervasive enough. It's certainly not universal and it tends to be at some of the more high acuity um, departments um, and focusing on clinical um, incidents more, um, but at least starting to develop those relationships. I would also add that on a hospital level, um, we are focusing more on um, upstander training. So if um, this may get at more, there's an emphasis with this more related to um, those underrepresented in medicine um, with an eye toward um, diversity and equity, um, but really um, giving people the language to speak up for each other and with the hope that that will impact um, the clinical um, environment and um, perhaps as a byproduct also help with learning. Um, I think I'll stop there. So thank you. We are going to the next question. Uh, this study appears to be a case study based on one hospital. And the question that always comes up when we have a case-based uh, um, study 
is uh, one of uh, generalizability, right? So could you please comment on how you think this work applies to other residency programs around the country and the world? Uh, let me toss that one to Laurie. I think she's got a lot of uh, multi-system experience there, so. Yeah, I would say when we first um, conceived of this problem, we bounced it off of a cohort of um, physicians across the country, actually across the world. And um, what is remarkable is everyone knows the story. So the story is um, the same. It's the story of the underperforming trainee and every physician who has done a residency either knows one of these stories or has been the um, the star of one of these stories. And so um, management of this um issue is on the curriculum um, for program directors, um, basically in program director schools, we call them for residencies and fellowships um, across the country, um, and um, certainly in every faculty development um, season, I make sure that it's on there. But much like was described in the loops, the, there's this myopic view of the balancing loop and um, usually it's really the view of this when it's spiraling catastrophically. And really what we're proposing is that vigorous emphasis on the reinforcing loop. Um, and we hope to underscore this for faculty and um, really where the work is um, starting to um, take shape is more in the interprofessional realm. And so really the emphasis around um, even nursing relationships. And that's what we're doing actually in our, in our institution now is looking at young, orienting nurses and really trying to emphasize the relationship on a cohort of people they don't believe intellectually that they really have impact on, but have such profound impact on. And thank you for that. We have a number of interesting questions here. Um, let me focus on a challenging one, a presentation focused on the training outcomes for residents. You know, but if the healthcare system's primary goal is better care, don't you want to explicitly account for the trade-off between investing in training and offering better care, which is built into the teaching hospital setup? Right, so trade-off between offering better care and the need to train, right, the, the, the residents, which might make mistakes. So how do we deal with that? Um, Anybody uh, feel uh, like they want to talk about that one? I think that um, actually um, it's an interesting question because I think that mistakes are um, something that are um, that occur in medicine throughout the lifespan of a of a physician, and so I'm I'm not sure that the mistakes per se are more in a trainee, but rather the um, ability to be able to recover from the mistakes. I think might be um, the piece that um, that a trainee is more. Um, at risk for not um, recovering from just based on their status within the environment itself. So I think the care and with the emphasis of quality and safety, I'm not sure that um, a training, the training itself impacts that in a way that is um, unsteady, just based on the fact that um, the way training programs are set up is that they're really working with um, faculty who are aware and able to, to um, provide care. Yeah, I was just going to say that's probably as a result of multiple changes since the 1980s on supervision and, and all those things. So, I um, mean, there have been also studies that demonstrate that in a training uh, in an academic hospital, you might actually have better care because more eyes on you and more, more um, you know, sort of thoughtful review of your conditions out, uh, versus a community hospital. Probably also resources tie into that. Okay, one question on the modeling effort. Uh, how did the model help identify the leverage points and simulating the effectiveness of alternative policies? Well, I guess I'll try to take that one. Um, the model is a very simple model. And uh, I think what it uh, helps identify is, uh, so when I say it's a simple model, uh, there's really one parameter that governs each of the two feedback loops. Uh, all of the other parameters are basically scaling and setting conditions and so on. So there's a generic idea in the model, which has to do with the, uh, the effect of the strength of the, of the trust, uh, uh, the, the trust effect on, on performance opportunities. Uh, that is a high leverage point in the simulation. The question that really needs to be asked though, is what is the, uh, what is the real world analog to that? How does that actually um, help 
uh, a residence, a resident or a program director or the, or the attendings uh, deal with things. So clearly what this, I think what this model is calling attention to is that there is a stock of trust and there are probably other related stocks that are generating uh, some of these potentially vicious feedback loops. And if the programs can begin to understand the importance of those stocks, whatever they call them, uh, it, it will shift the conversation away from the focus exclusively on just pushing residents harder and harder to work. And so this is a, in some ways a, um, a, a small advance that we're trying to claim here, which is just to demonstrate that um, the program matters too. It's not just about the, the, the residents. And that may seem amazingly obvious. And I think what we see is that it's, it's um, uh, the behavior of program directors and attendings doesn't necessarily reflect that very effectively. So I'm not sure if that answered the question, but that's what I got.